So without further ado, who's up next is um, Adam from CERN. And uh, I had the pleasure of sort of sitting down with Adam last night and having a bit of dinner. Um, and he's a little worried now about what story I'm going to tell from dinner. But um, it went something like this. Hey, so you, you, you're at CERN, you got this, this collider, and you got this, you know, this huge big accelerator there of particles, and isn't that cool? And it was like, yeah, that's okay. Yeah, go down every now and then and have a look at it. Um, I said, well, you know, can we get to see it? Yeah, I'm a tour guide. Just you know, sign up for the tour. That, that, that's it. So then, then I got into more of the influx stuff going, well, you, 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 you know, 2,000 nodes there. You've got, uh, what was the number? 600 kilohertz monitoring rate. That's, that's amazing. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, I'm a tour guide for that too. And he's going to be the tour guide. So over to Adam and talk about the tour of CERN. Introduction. I know it's going to be fine. I have 50%. No, a bit more. Yes, it's working. Perfect. Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, my name is Adam, and I have a pleasure to talk for the first time during the Impacts days. So maybe just a few words about myself. Uh, yes, yes, better. So I'm a telecommunication engineer working at CERN, currently for the Alice Data Acquisition team, and I'm currently involved in the upgrade of the experiment, which is called O Square. That's why this. Nice logo over there. Um, so the scope of my work covers uh, networking, some full stack web projects, and a uh, loads of C++ because this is a physicist's favorite language. So I need to do it. <laughs> uh, so I'm neither monitoring nor SRE expert, as you can see. Um, so during this talk, I'm going to give you some introduction about CERN for, the, for some people that are not aware of what we are doing there. I'll give some overview of the InfluxDB usage, mostly in the CERN IT department. It's the main user of InfluxDB at CERN. And then I eventually go into some technical details of the new monitoring system for Alice, which actually uses InfluxDB. So let's start. CERN, or European Organization for Nuclear Research, it's the largest particle center, a physics particle, uh, particle center in the world. It lays both on French and Swiss territory, uh, it hosts 16,000 member collaborators, and it has around 700 buildings that spans over a six square kilometer of land. So it's a, quite a big organization, as you can see. Um, it is managed and financed by, by 22 member states. Actually, not all of them are uh, European countries. Uh, there is also some associated member states, which are the countries that are about to join, and uh, additional observer states, countries with cooperation agreements, etc., etc. So actually, there's a lot of countries involved in the project. It's not just some few European countries. Um, so, CERN is mostly known from the wide variety of different uh, accelerators, and actually, LHC is the largest of them. It's hidden 100 meters underground uh, in the 27 kilometers long tunnel. And it uses so-called superconducting magnets, which operates at around zero Kelvin. So it's like 460 Fahrenheit, minus 460 Fahrenheit for US people, sorry. <laughs> so such a temperature is required to uh, produce sufficient magnetic fields to bend the partic particles, which travel at the speed of light, more or less, is like almost 99.9999% of speed of light. And so this, this blue pipe consists of uh, two beams circulating opposite directions, and they collide in the four interaction points uh, where the major experiments are located. So actually CERN is not only the uh, LHC and particle physics. It also is involved into different uh, fields of studies. For example, ESOLT experiments, it uh, studies non-conventional radioisotopes for cancer treatment. 
Uh, the cloud experiment is one of my favorites because it studies the uh, link between galactic cosmic rays and the formation of clouds, which is a cool idea. And we have also experiments AMS, which is located at the International Space Station. And this is looks for the dark, ma dark matter, antimatter, and measures precisely some uh, specific cosmic rays. All right. So moving back to the collisions, many people ask me, why do you do it? I mean, what's, what do you do with these collisions? I mean, uh, yeah, there's, there's a pipe, there, they collide, you actually cannot see it, so what's the point? So, uh, so the collisions actually reconstructed into something like here you can see, uh, and they are made available to physicists who analyze them using some statistical, mathematical, physics knowledge, etc. So, I'll just explain you how this process uh, is done. So, uh, when when the particles are about to collide, you have a special hardware at the experiment, uh, which is called trigger and it tells the, uh, the, all the other subsystems just to start collecting the data. And during the collision, the, the shower particle is created. This is, we call it the particle shower. And this is passes through different detectors. And these detectors, they are, they are just generating the, uh, the signals, which is pushed via some special electronic devices into the computing farm. Uh, this, this process we call readouts. And then this data then is processed, compressed, uh, many different algorithms are applied, uh, and eventually stored in, into, into the storage. And the physicists, they can actually pick up this data and apply the, the algorithms, the, the statistical uh, stuff, just to find out new things, uh, create some uh, plots, dashboards, histograms, etc. So I was actually talking about the storage uh, so we store this data in things which is called Word LAC computing grid. It's a, um, it's, a, it's a place that we store and uh, analyze the reconstructed data and it spreads over 170 computing centers in 34 different countries. It runs around 2 million tasks a day using uh, 750,000 cores and it already stores around 800 petabytes of data. And uh, I'm saying this because I'm moving to the second part of my presentation. And actually, the, the IT department at CERN is responsible for the, for the tier zero, for the core of, the, of this computing grid. And this, this core consists of two uh, data centers interconnected with each other, providing 20% 20, 20 of the computing power. Um, and we are using, actually, InfluxDB to monitor this tier zero. Uh, which is, uh, let's say, quite a large sensor. <laughs> and we are using around 31 instances for this reason, uh, and we write 1.6 terabytes of metric a day uh, to InfluxDB. In addition to that, each computing center in the WLCG has its own internal monitoring, and there are many more tier one, tier two data centers that are using InfluxDB as well, but I'll just skip it because uh, this is the largest scale <laughs> we are. Having. So in addition to that, in, uh, we have a service at CERN which, which is called DB On Demand. It's just a simple web self-service interface. You just click and you can request any database you want. And uh, we are using it a lot as we're doing a lot of experiments, uh, a lot of trials, a lot of prototypes, etc. And actually, uh, you can request InfluxDB instance as well for this interface. And currently, we already have 90 instances in the production. So there's a 90, let's say, projects that are using uh, this service at CERN currently, and they write all of them 1.5 million points per second. All right, so I think I'm speaking a bit too fast because it's already almost the middle of the presentation. <laughs> uh, all right, so maybe I'll slow down a bit, and I'm just gonna move to the uh, last section, which I will dive a bit into technical details of the, of the new monitoring system of the ALICE experiment. And ALICE stands for Air Large Ion Collider Experiments. Uh, it consists of 19 detectors, uh, specialized in heavy ions, actually. Uh, the heavy ions allow to form a matter which is called quark-gluon plasma. 
and uh, it is assumed that this quark gluon plasma had been present during the Big Bang, and the all the ma matter cur currently existing at the Earth was actually uh, evolved from the quark gluon plasma. That's why we are really interested in studying this. Uh, so the interesting fact is that the during the, these collisions we produced quite a high temperature, which is like hundreds thousands times higher than the sun, and. On the right side, so you can see the scale of the experiment. These are just some people standing looking at, at, at all these detectors. Um, all right, so as I mentioned before, uh, each experiment has sort of uh, a system that process and reconstruct the data. Uh, and in at least we're actually finishing up the upgrade of a such system. Um, so the upgraded system will continuously read out around 7.2 terabytes of data a second over 9,000 fibers. And uh, then it applied some first level compressing, uh, decreasing it to 500 gigabytes per second, and then eventually uh, GPU accelerated a reconstruction that brings down the data to 100 gigabytes, and this is written to the storage, and eventually to the uh, WCG probably. Um, so such system requires quite a lot of monitoring. As, uh, as it already mentioned, we estimated around six, 600,000 metric per second, uh, arriving sort of asynchronously from 100,000 different uh, sources, because this is actually the number of the processes we expect to have in our farm. Um, so we also don't really want to introduce any kind of high latency into the system because we have uh, many critical values we want to ship to the uh, to the shift crew in the uh, control center. Uh, so for this reason, we evaluated quite many tools. You just I just uh, listed some of them. There's uh, of course EflexDB among them. There's a lot of Apache stuff. Uh, but we eventually came up to the following solution. Uh, maybe I'll just start from the gray boxes, which are the uh, the processing devices. They implement the uh, the uh, compression and uh, reconstruction logic, and these are linked against our custom-made C++ uh, monitoring library. Uh, we have also CollectD that uh, governs some performance metrics. It also monitors our custom hardware. We have many FPGA boards, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and all these data are shipped to the uh, FLAM over UDP protocol, uh, and uh, they are routed in the FLAM. Uh, so they routed to uh, Spark for the aggregation and re-injected back to FLAM. Uh, some of them are shipped directly to Grafana uh, without going through InfluxDB. And uh, some of them they go just to Riemann to trigger some alarms and notifications uh, for our operation teams. And of course, we write everything to InfluxDB, which is our, let's say, main uh, heart of our system. All right. So I just want to promote the monitoring library because actually I, I wrote it, so that's why I put a slide on it. <laughs> so it's a, it's a just purely written C++ library uh, that allows you to write the data to uh, almost anywhere you want. It supports ZB, it supports FLAM, it supports Zabbix, it supports many money monitoring systems. Uh, it can actually process, uh, sorry, it, it can actually monitor the process it's running uh, within, so it can govern the how much uh, CPU the process is using, how much memory, uh, how much network, et cetera, et cetera. So it does for the each process, for this 100,000 proce uh, processes running uh, at our farm, it does this stuff. Uh, it, has, it, it also performs some initial aggregation, so we can already calculate some derived metrics, like rate, average value, some deltas, et cetera, et cetera, so we can actually offload the central monitoring from the, from the basic processing. Uh, and it can also cache some metrics so we don't send one by one, we can send in some batches as well. It's of course open source so you can just click and take a look uh, what's there and use it if you want. So just so we want to really find out if our system is able to handle such a load. So we have a, a test configuration node with the, uh, some Intel Xeon CPU, 40, 64 gigs of RAM, we have two network cards. I'll explain later what two, not one. And we have uh, two Intel SSD disks that are configured in RAID 0 to just improve some performance. And we're running over CentOS 7 with uh, 
mainline stable kernel version 416 and just one in FlexDB database, which sounds crazy, right? Usually you want 100 or something like this. But okay, let's start with one, let's see what's gonna happen. <laughs> um, oh, just, just to ex explain you why I was using two cards, because actually the first, I was working with 40 gig internet cards, and then it was really uh, a pain to set up some, uh, some, some configuration in the Mellanox card, which is 40 gig. And then I moved back to QLogic, and actually it turns out that the 40 gig uh, technology is just, it, it disappeared because it's not efficient, it, has a, it doesn't really scale up to higher values, like 100 gigabits. Uh, it has a lower switch port density, and also it's more expensive. So of course the 25, 50, 100 gig is the way to go. So before jumping into results, I'll go just for some internals of the, uh, of the receive stack of the Linux. I'll just say some, of course, I will just mention some optimizations I have done in order to, to, uh, to get the best values possible. So in general, if you have a UDP packet coming from the, uh, uh, coming, from, coming to the InfluxDB, it goes from the uh, network card, and then the, it is actually injected into one of the queues. This is done uh, thanks to the receipt size scaling, which allows you to, uh, to use multiple queues, so, so you actually can use multiple CPUs to press, process this packet. Uh, then the uh, network card, it raises interrupt to the CPU just to tell it that, okay, there's something to do, some, some new data arrived. And then the driver picks up the packets from the memory and it passes to the correspondingly, corresponding daemons, uh, which are called software interrupt daemons, and actually they, they are in charge of processing uh, and de-encapsulating the IP and the UDP and passing the payload to the, uh, to the socket, so to the InfluxDB. <coughs> Um, so, this is look really nice, but here is like a bit of mess, and this is just because uh, I was not able to pin the endpoints of the InfluxDB because I didn't have really like internal uh, access to the internal configuration. Um, so I, I just kept them on the same NUMA nodes without pinning the, the endpoints to the correct CPUs. So I think, I think it's just good enough. So I'm just gonna go through just some overview without getting into details optimizations that I have done to, uh, to get the, the results. Um, so at first, uh, you just need to disable the Linux scaling governor. This is a power saving mode that will scale the frequency of your CPU just to save some power. Uh, I also have to change the receive flow hash. So just to explain you what is this, uh, so when you uh, when you when the when the packet arrives, the as I said before, there's a, this receive size scaling uh, thing that chooses the queue, and it chooses the queue based on on the hash, and this hash is actually calculated based on the IP source and destination address. So the thing is that when I was doing this test, I was using just two machines. It means they were just the IP source and destination IP address was the same. So I was actually using only single queue, which was a bit annoying. Uh, so you have to actually modify the, 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 the receive flow hash uh, function to add some more variables like port numbers in order to be able to use uh, all the queues. <laughs> all right, next, uh, I just increased a bit the socket receive queue, uh, which is a queue where the data is put on hold when the socket is busy. Uh, I turn off the RAQ balance, which spreads the load, the interrupt load over CPUs and this actually may cause some strange behaviors because uh, um, this daemon just thinks, okay, I've put some interrupts on this CPU, so I'm gonna put it on the other one, and then you have some uh, drops in the performance and you, you just don't know where it's coming from, so it's just better to turn it off and pin uh, the processes to the CPUs manually. Uh, then I made sure that the uh, network cards and the uh, uh, the, sorry, network card and the uh, interrupts and the InfluxDB were running at the same NUMA nodes. So you don't really want to use the inter-CPU interconnect because it will give you a lot of uh, overheads. So uh, this is most important when you have a machine with dual CPUs. Uh, then I disabled the GRO, which is like generic received offloads. So this is a, 
optimization, which is not really widely used, uh, it aggregates multi multiple packets into a single one and before passing it to the higher level, but this was not really uh, useful for this test and this just introduced another overhead. So the last thing is that I was not able to get the best results using one single socket. So I just wanted to use a, an option which is called reuse port. Uh, this allows you to uh, bin the same port number to multiple sockets. Uh, but I didn't find a way of doing this in FluxDB. I think, I think even Go doesn't support it. So I just work it around by just setting multiple UDP uh, endpoints, <laughs> which was good enough. Okay, so now I'll show you some uh, charts with the performance I got. So this is just a pure writing to the database and you can see the dashed uh, yellow curve. Hopefully it's yellow, yes, it is yellow. Um, this, is a, this is a plot that shows successfully, percentage of su successfully stored metrics uh, in a function of the metric rate in kilohertz. So for example, for um, on, the, on the yellow curve, you can see that around 500 kilohertz, you start dropping metrics. It means that not all the metrics will arrive in, into your system. Uh, so from this, we can, actually, uh, we can actually find out up to which point we can use the system and what will be the drop and what are the consequences of going higher or etc. So as you can see for the uh, InfluxDB behaves quite well, you can easily go around 700 kilohertz a second using single instance, which is an uh, amazing result. Uh, and both, actually both internet cards, they did the same uh, job because the actually it's, it's not the data volume which, which is the limiting factor, it's just the uh, packet rate that is limiting the, the performance. All right, okay, but it's not only writing, we just need to read the data. So I just executed a simple query just to estimate how much time does it take to read the data when there is no uh, major uh, tasks running on the machine. So it just, you can, you can the request completes uh, at around four milliseconds, which is good enough. It's, uh, it means that you can do 550 requests per second, which is more than you need. But the problem comes when you need to do reading and writing at the same time, right? This is what you actually wanted, your real system. And unfortunately, uh, of course it was expected because uh, otherwise why would you have Linux, uh, InfluxDB Enterprise version? You could just use this. Uh, of course, uh, the, the, the reading time uh, when I was reading and writing, uh, the query time went up to 310 milliseconds. It means three queries per second. So probably if you just start your dashboard in Grafana and you need to do like hundreds of queries, it will take forever to load. So actually this, this, this needs to be improved and this is actually what I'm currently doing, so we're trying to partition the system and use the multiple uh, InfluxDB instances. And as we are using Flunt, it can actually choose which, where are you writing your data, where are you pushing your data. We can just, we can write to any, any amount of InfluxDB databases we want. And we currently estimated that three databases will be enough to read and write all the data and uh, we want. All right, so actually these are the future steps for the system. So. As I said, uh, we need to do the partitioning. Uh, we need to do also the alarming because we, are, we haven't played with Riemann yet. As you just said that you're gonna have uh, alarming in InfluxDB, maybe we're just gonna drop Riemann and just start using InfluxDB, why not? And the most challenging part is just the uh, connecting the flam directly to the Grafana. And uh, we'd like to use a WebSocket for this reason. We already took a look into it. Uh, but we are still counting on Grafana developers because as they have it in the roadmap under the in distance future far, far away, we still count that it's not that far away, <laughs> but we are fully ready to contribute this feature if they don't plan it implemented over, let's say, one year. So we have, uh, we have it covered. All right, so maybe a summary. So at CERN, quite a few major projects, they really use InfluxDB. Uh, we have the DB on demand service that promotes the usage of InfluxDB among the same users. Uh, InfluxDB really can write a lot of data. And if you plan your system, uh, this is what I learned. I need to really avoid unnecessary reads. I mean, there's a lot of reads that you don't really need. I mean, you can really optimize it in a way that uh, it can really improve the performance of your system. 
Uh, okay, and this will be the last slide. Uh, I just want to mention that if you happen to be in Geneva area and like to visit some, uh, you can just contact the visiting service or you can contact me and you can really go underground. You can see all the nice experiments. You can learn new stuff. Just be sure that you, that you come to CERN when we do not operate because when we operate, you, you can actually cannot go downstairs because there's, uh, of course, radiation and it just kills you, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm just saying. Go no ahead. worries. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Uh, I have a question regarding uh, influx DB, and did you try to, uh, you know, test the other solutions like Elastic, for example? Uh, so you Elastic, know. actually, no. So we have we tried. I, I showed briefly the the tools we evaluated. We have our sort of custom time series database, which comes from our previous system, which, which is based on PostgreSQL. Uh, we also tried uh, Prometheus, but okay, this was not, it doesn't scale for our reasons, but um, we didn't try Elastic because this is, we, we want to really split the metric logic and the log logic between, from, from, from in, in our system. Hi. When you say you're uh, working on the alarming next, is that um, so science and hardware alarming as well, or is it just your own internal metrics? Okay. So um, it's mostly software related. Uh, although we have some custom hardware, we're gonna uh, we're gonna have some alarming as well. Um, maybe I'll just add a bit that we have more or less in our experience two different monitoring systems. One system is about the data flow, about the servers and detectors. And the second one is like, let's say more crucial, which, is, which, which uh, covers radioactivity, ventilation, electricity, et cetera. Uh, and maybe probably the, this alarming you're asking for. So this is a separate system, but yeah. Uh, it may also at some point start using some benefits of our system. Hello. Your slides mentioned some really good networking optimizations for ingress of metrics, but you didn't really mention anything about disk performance or writing to disk. Does that mean you don't really need to optimize influx for storage, or it just wasn't mentioned? Um, so, uh, okay. So actually, the uh, the disk was behaving quite well because as it was the quite performant SSD in the right zero, I didn't see any overhead on disks at this point. So that's why I was not looking into it. It was the, from the beginning, the, 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 the issue was the, the networking. So that's why I focused mostly on this. So as we're gonna probably at some point start having some problems with disk, probably we, we dive into this as well. But we also have really uh, good hardware people that are actually optimizing the disks for us, so that's maybe that's why it was a bit skipped. Okay. That's awesome, thank you. Thank you. Oh, one more question. Oh, one more, okay. Yeah. Monday. Yeah, there'll be a Monday. <laughs> okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you.